Well, this is a part eight on a series I've been talking about abiding in the love of God. And the verse that I've been using each single session is John 15, verse 9, where I paraphrase uh, Jesus is saying that in the same intensity that the Father loves me, that's how I love you. This same intensity. That's a very dramatic statement. I mean, that truth alone will revolutionize our lives. In Isaiah 62, the the Lord says that I'm going to name my people, my delight is in them. That's the what God calls his people, I delight in him. And so this is the ultimate statement of our worth, that Jesus loves us like the Father loves him, that God delights in us, that God enjoys us. Now this is the basis of, of how we love ourselves in the grace of God, that we're actually participating in the very love and delight that God has for us. So if God loves us and God delights in us, then surely we agree with God and we participate in that very delight and in that very love. Paragraph B, the second commandment is like the first Jesus said. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I use this uh, illustration each time I I mention this verse, that the lady prayed, Lord, I want to love my neighbor as I love myself. And the Lord says, that's the problem. You do love your neighbor the way you love yourself. That's why you hate your neighbor, because you hate yourself. Now, there's two different applications of loving ourself. One is right and one is wrong. We love ourselves in the grace of God, but others love themselves according to the flesh. And loving ourselves in the grace of God will empower our life and transform us. Loving ourselves according to the flesh is actually destructive. And we're denied to deny that kind of love. Now, the reason I mention those two is that in pop psychology and self-help seminars, even Christian ones, they mix these principles up. And so there's a merger and a confusion of how we are actually to love ourselves from a biblical point of view. Because Jesus said clearly here we're to love ourselves, but he said other times we are to hate our own lives and deny ourselves. So which is it? Well, it's both of them because there's no contradiction in those uh, uh, two different truths. We again, we love ourselves in the in the very love we participate in the very love that God has for us, and we do this in light of what Jesus did for us on the cross. When Jesus died for us on the cross, He made us a new creation in Christ. And that's the person that we love in the grace of God, who we are in the Spirit, and who we are in God's eyes because of what Jesus did for us. We love and see ourselves in the very love and delight that God has for us and the very value that he has for us. Paragraph B, Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, who uh, was a, a primary teacher in the body of Christ in the 12th century, he made this profound statement in his time that, live, that we are to live in the blessedness of loving ourself in God and loving ourself for God's sake. He spoke of that we should be jealous to be all that he called us to be for God's own sake and that his own love would be magnified and displayed in doing that. We must refuse all the false humility that minimizes the truth about how God enjoys us in Christ Jesus. I mean, he actually enjoys us. Again, Isaiah 62, he names his people, I delight in you. What a a glorious truth. Now, God doesn't love us under duress. He doesn't say, well, you know, Jesus died, and I am God the Father. I'll love you. He doesn't grit his teeth to love us. He actually enjoys loving us. 
And we are to enjoy him enjoying us. Beloved, that's the basis of why we can enjoy ourselves. There's a part of ourselves we deny and a part of ourselves we resist, but there's a truth about us, who we are in Christ, that we actually love and we enjoy in the grace of God. Paragraph E, he delights in the person that he made you. We delight in that very same person, even though it's about ourselves. It's the person Jesus died for, the person he loves, and the person that he made new in Christ. Now somebody might say, well, how do we know if we're loving ourselves according to the grace of God or loving ourselves according to the flesh? I mean, one is positive and essential, actually more than positive, and the other's very destructive. How do we know which is which? Well, when we love ourselves in the biblical way, we grow in humility. When we love ourselves in the biblical way, we grow in purity. We grow in a servant spirit. When we love ourselves according to the flesh, we actually become more selfish, more preoccupied with ourselves. We, are, we feel more entitled in our anger when we're not treated the way we want to be treated. And we say, well, you know, the Bible says love ourselves." No, that's not the kind of love the Bible's talking about. Paragraph F. There's a deep connection between loving God, loving ourselves, and loving others. Matter of fact, it's the same reality. It's called the love of God. It's the love that dwells in God's own personality. It's God himself. It's his presence. Now, we won't love others well if we are overwhelmed by the negative emotional traffic in us of our own bitterness and fears and sense of rejection. We naturally have uh, struggles with rejection and insecurities and fears. It's, it's normal to our humanity. The uh, tendency to compare ourselves with one another, to have bitternesses and complaints. But those things are like emotional traffic that really minimize and hinder our ability to love God and to love other people, to even love ourselves. And so the Lord is, is showing us that as we get, as that emotional traffic is minimized by seeing the way he sees us and entering into the very love and delight he has for us that we actually enter into that love and delight for our own life, that emotional traffic is minimized. Beloved, we'll, we will love far better. We'll love better in our marriages, in our families, in our friendships, in the marketplace. Paragraph G. I'm going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Just look at verse 10. This is a, a essential truth in terms of the ability to love ourselves. That we see, as the scripture says, we are his workmanship. We are the product that the master builder has built by very specific design. You are, he's the artist. Your soul in life is the canvas of which his beautiful artistry is displayed to the world. He's actually working a plan in your life that is very tailor-made and specific to who you are. Now it says here in verse 10, we are his workmanship. We are the object of his focused working design. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now these were good works that God prepared beforehand. Beloved, even when you were in your mother's womb, he specifically designed you for the good works that you would do, but not only in this age, but with continuity to the age to come. This design of God for your life doesn't end when you die in your physical death. It goes on. It's the, the real you goes on forever and forever in the resurrection, and the plan continues. The glorious storyline 
about your life actually unfolds in a far greater dimension in the age to come. Now when it says here, we were created for good works, don't think of good works only as individual deeds that we do. What Paul is saying here is that God created each individual believer to display a specific message about himself through your life. So when you see the phrase good works, add a divine message, a message about the beauty and the glory of God. So what Paul is saying is, in your mother's womb, beforehand, before you were even born, God was planning to convey a message through you. And that message would be about the glory of God and the way that you would interact with him and display the beauty and the glory of who he is. Now, the, to understand this message, this good works, this life calling, we have to understand that there is continuity between the plan of God for us in this life and the plan of God for us in the resurrection. It's one plan in two stages. It's like the book of your life. The first chapter is the, is the 70 years on the earth or whatever, however many years God gives. But the rest of the book is the 70 billion years. And then the billions after those billions. And so it's so glorious that there is this long-term master plan with continuity between this age and the age to come. The same story, there's that message he's working in you. He strategically designed you for it. That's glorious that what we do in this age, in our choices for humility and godliness, in our small acts of service that nobody even notices, that God remembers them and they are a part of our story even in the age to come. He rewards us for them forever. They move him. Well, that's, as gl that's glorious because that makes our life so significant now, the fact that it has continuity with the age to come. But that glorious point has a challenge, is that we tend to only see chapter one about our life story. So we see chapter one and Things aren't going so well externally in our circumstances. Things aren't working out externally the way that we thought they should. And we think, Lord, we feel cheated. We feel mistreated. He goes, no, you've only read chapter one of a really long story. Trust me, there's continuity between the two. 